Greetings, students. Um, my name is Malcolm Burns. As you know already, I'm an instructor here in the first year medical course. And my goal today is to uh, record a lecture uh, on the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, uh, glycoprotein, uh, for you to use uh, and, and view uh, before the flipped classroom that's occurring on Friday, July the 16th at 8, 8 a.m. There's also a, uh, a quiz for you to take on Blackboard to help prepare you for the quiz that you'll have during that flip class. Uh, there's also uh, on Blackboard a description of the structure of that class, uh, along with some discussion questions, some questions for discussion um, that I'm going to ask you to engage in during the class. Uh, so that the quiz you'll have uh, will be on ExamSoft uh, and we'll quickly go over the answers before we dismiss on Friday <clears throat> the 16th. Uh, but today is um, uh, July the 7th and I'm sitting out here on my deck in suburban Maryland uh, on a warm uh, July day um, in what hopefully will be uh, some of the closing days of this pandemic that has lasted now for a year and a half. Uh, many of us are vaccinated. Uh, I'm fully vaccinated. I uh, understand that you are too. And actually it's the development of vaccines, <clears throat> uh, an amazing scientific achievement that has uh, allowed us to be in the place we are now. Although frankly, there's a lot of pockets, uh, a lot of communities in America where people are hesitant to receive the vaccine, uh, receive the vaccination. And, uh, and that's one, one thing that's causing a prolongation of the pandemic. <clears throat> but, but today, the focus is going to be on that particular glycoprotein after a brief introduction. So now I'm gonna share a sc the screen. And so the uh, title of uh, my lecture today is the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike-like protein. I think I need to stop my email. Let me do that real quick. <clears throat> okay, again, the Severe Acute uh, Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein, structure, unusual features, and role in host cell entry. Now, um, I've had to update this lecture. Uh, about a year ago, I gave it uh, for the first year medical students. Um, and as you know, things have changed a lot. Um, some of the information um, in this uh, lecture is, is the same, uh, but other information, of course, is updated. So, um, Johns Hopkins University um, has what's called a tracker, a COVID-19 tracker and dashboard. And this is a screenshot of that dashboard. And the, uh, the site is located uh, and is available um, at the uh, address listed down here, the URL at the bottom here. Um, and there's some different things that are obvious from this uh, from this map in the middle, which shows where um, most of the cases um, have been. Um, the recorded confirmed cases of COVID-19. Um, and you can see that the United States of America <coughs> um, has had a lot of cases. Uh, and in fact, in terms of confirmed uh, cases and deaths, uh, we still lead the world. Um, but a quick note here is that in some countries, um, th there has not been a faithful recording of cases and deaths, right? so that there may be, in fact, you know, many fold more cases than the official number and deaths as well. Uh, so after the US, we see uh, India, Brazil, France, Russia, Turkey, and so on in terms of cases.
But if you look at Brazil, which is a country much smaller than the US, uh, it's quickly approaching, sadly, uh, the number of deaths that we've had. Uh, and a lot of that actually stems from certain variants of, of SARS-CoV-2 that have arisen and have spread uh, rapidly because they're uh, more transmissible. And we're going to talk about those. So this is a, a coronavirus world map. Um, and we're looking here at the uh, global outbreak. This is from the New York Times, starting from, you know, very early in 2020 uh, through January 2021 to the present day of um, June the 30th, when this was updated. Of course, the situation is constantly changing. Uh, but here we see uh, um, a graph showing the seven day average of, of cases, new reported cases, seven day average, which means that um, you take a day and average over the last seven days and report that value. Uh, and that sort of takes into account daily fluctuations and gives a more reliable number of cases. So we see, you know, how there was this tremendous surge, you know, uh, in December and January uh, of, of last year. And then there has been another recent surge. Uh, actually, a lot of that was driven uh, by what was happening in India. <clears throat> but um, so as of June the 30th of this year, there have been um, about 182 million cases and uh, uh, almost 4 million deaths uh, from COVID-19. And here's some uh, sort of interesting information on the right-hand side over here. So let's look now uh, at the United States. That previous uh, uh, graph was uh, was um, for the world. Let's look uh, at, at the U.S. in particular, looking at case cases, deaths, and vaccine doses by day. Hold on just a minute. I'm going to adjust something. Okay, back again. So uh, let's look at let's look at this. Uh, in terms of cases in the U.S., uh, you can see again there are about uh, 34 um, million cases. Um, and yesterday, uh, that is, I guess, uh, June the 29th, there were about 11,000 cases. Uh, it has dropped off significantly uh, since that you know, November, December, January, February timescale, when there was this tremendous peak in cases. Uh, deaths have also dropped off uh, dramatically. Uh, so that um, there, there's a total, uh, unfortunately, of over 600,000 deaths from COVID-19. Uh, and yesterday, that is uh, January the 29th, there were 271 deaths. Um, a lot of this decrease uh, in, fr in frankly is because of a vaccination. Uh, the people, a lot of people have gotten vaccinated and we can see the what's happened here. Uh, from uh, mid-December when vac vaccines became available until, I don't know, what is this? Um, May, April, May, there was a steady increase but now there's been a steady decrease in the number of vaccine doses administered. So far, we've administered 327 or so uh, million doses. And, and as of and on June the 29th, about um, 1.4 million. That should be a comma there, that last one there, uh, not a period, a comma. This is from the Washington Post. They also have a coronavirus uh, section. Uh, yes. So, so a, a big part of the reason why there's been this uh, decline in, um, 
in, in debt, hospitalizations and deaths has been the fact that a vaccine is available and people have gotten vaccinated. Hold on just a minute. Um, and there's a number of vaccines uh, out there, okay? Some of them you may recognize, others you may not. So one is the Pfizer-BioNTech mRNA-based vaccine, which involves a two-dose regimen. And the second dose occurs three weeks after the first. And this uh, vaccine has a 95% efficacy. Moderna also has an mRNA-based two-dose reg uh, regimen vaccine uh, where the doses are uh, four weeks apart. And uh, it has a similar efficacy to the Pfizer. Johnson & Johnson um, and involves uh, a vector, an adenovirus vector as the carrier um, of the vaccine. It's, so it's uh, vector-based and involves a single dose and it has a 66 to 72% efficacy. Uh, there's this range here because uh, under the different populations apparently it's had different efficacy, but that's sort of where it is. Um, AstraZeneca, which has been used uh, heavily in Europe, in the UK, in Europe, it was developed by Oxford uh, University in collaboration with um, <clears throat> AstraZeneca. Uh, is an adenovirus-based vaccine. It involves a two-dose regimen now, although it used to be one dose. Now it's two, and the uh, doses are six or 12 weeks apart. They've been still sort of uh, experimenting with the uh, spacing of the dosing, of the dosages, dose. Uh, it's about 81% uh, efficacy, uh, and that's when they're spaced 12 weeks apart. So it's, it's not bad, it's not bad in terms of its efficacy. And there are others, but the five um, being developed in Russia is also adenovirus based. Uh, and it's Russia has uh, sent doses to other countries, India in particular, Hungary, Korea, China, reportedly has a 91.4% efficacy. Uh, there were concerns about the quality of the clinical data, but I think those have been largely allayed and this efficacy has stood up uh, to scrutiny. So it, it does appear to have a pretty high efficacy. Sinovac also known as, there's also a similar one called Sinopharm that are produced in China. These involve an, act, an inactivated SARS-CoV-2 virus itself, a two dose regimen and widely varying efficacies from about 50 to 91%. So it ranges dramatically. Uh, it's been used in Indonesia, Thailand, Bahrain, Chile, and the Seychelles. Uh, recently, there have been concerns about it. In Indonesia, uh, people have fallen ill despite having been vaccinated. So they appear to be, um, it doesn't protect as well. Uh, as people would like, the sign of banks. There are others, and here's an article, by the way, about that case in Indonesia, um, in The Guardian. Uh, others include Novavax, which is made in the U.S. and it's protein-based. Can Sino Biologics has produced a vaccine? Vaccine. It's a Chinese uh, company, and it's adenovirus-based, using a viral antigen instead of the uh, spike protein. Uh, Covaxin, uh, produced by Bharat Biotech in India. It involves an in inactivated SARS-CoV-2. And then Abdallah and so Soberana too, which are two of several vaccines being produced in Cuba. So Cuba has its own uh, vaccine production or and development effort, which is pretty impressive. I wanna point out that um, <clears throat> these first three Pfizer BioNTech, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson have been approved for use in the United States by the US FDA. They're all three are highly effective, near 100% at preventing serious illness, hospitalization, and death. 
So actually the United States of America is in a pretty good place in terms of vaccine availability. And this story of the production of vaccines is a, a really uh, remarkable, remarkable one where in about a year uh, from start to finish, uh, a vaccine, vaccine was uh, designed, developed and made available to the public, a, a truly uh, impressive scientific feat. So I wanna talk about one of these. I wanna talk about the Moderna mRNA-1273 mRNA-based vaccine. And on the left here, we see different nucleic acid vaccines that have DNA or RNA. So the Moderna mRNA-1273 vaccine is an mRNA-based vaccine. So the RNA is encased in a lipid coat, sort of a lipid nanoparticle that can enter uh, cells. So when it's injected uh, into the into the bloodstream, uh, it uh, it can enter cells via this um, lipid coated uh, nanoparticle. And when it gets and it it's, it it releases its mRNA contents into the cell, and, and those mRNAs can be then uh, translated into uh, the viral spike protein, uh, which then um, um, which then exits the cell and is incorporated onto the surface of, of certain immune cells, uh, which then uh, trigger the immune response so that the body develops uh, antibodies, antibodies and, and has other responses uh, using the immune system involving T cells. Uh, so it, 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 it uh, initiates an immune response that prepares the body for a real uh, uh, infection. So again, vaccines are typically um, viral components that when injected, give the immune system a preview of the virus without causing disease. All right. Now, one thing about this uh, mRNA that's present, that's present here uh, in the, in the uh, nanoparticle is that uh, the process uses chemical modifications to stabilize the mRNA. Okay, so it, these are chemically stabilized and not just stabilized, but the modifications actually uh, prevent, um, what's the right word? Um, allow an, a proper immune response. They allow the body to, to launch a proper immune response. If you didn't uh, modify the mRNA, uh, bad things would happen and, and the response would not be uh, appropriate. And actually um, uh, that technology was developed in part uh, by a scientist at uh, the University of Pennsylvania who, who did a lot of research on RNA modifications that allow mRNAs to be used uh, as a basis for a vaccine. Okay. Uh, again, this has been appro approved for emergency use by the FDA. <clears throat> now, I have here a picture of Dr. Kismikia Corbett. She was uh, intimately involved in the development of the Moderna mRNA-1273 vaccine. Uh, she is the NIH scientific team leader for this vaccine's design and development. Other priorities of her team have been other coronavirus vaccine candidates and therapeutic antibodies. Uh, she has spent several years working on, she did spend several years working on a universal influenza vaccine and has over 15 years of experience in virus research. She received her BS degrees in biology and sociology from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, which is uh, nearby where she was a, a Meyerhoff scholar and an NIH undergraduate scholar. She received her PhD in 2014 from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in microbiology and immunology. And in 2021, this year, she received an honorary doctor of science degree from UNC Chapel Hill 
And another small uh, tidbit of information was that um, she was a, a keynote speaker at a recent conference called, uh, titled Black in X. You may have heard of Black in Neuroscience, you know, Black in Engineering, and so on. There was a movement after uh, George Floyd's murder last summer, uh, and even before with the Black Birders Week, to call attention to Black scientists and to hear Black voices in science. So she was a keynote speaker, and I believe that one of your classmates also was a keynote speaker uh, at that conference. But she's a real, Dr. Corbett is a real vaccine hero. All right, um, now, um, one thing that has uh, raised alarm bells, if you will, has been the uh, development or the um, advent of certain variants of concern of SARS-CoV-2. And um, the nomenclature for these variants, uh, th these variants have mutations uh, in, their, uh, in their RNA genome that um, um, that may that some of which uh, lead to um, um, either uh, more a more transmissible virus uh, or to uh, the ability to at least partially escape antibodies produced by the body. Um, and so they are um, of concern because they can um, lead to more disease uh, and possibly worse disease. Here, I'm gonna rotate this table a bit. I'm sort of in the sun here. Let me get out of the sun. It's an evolving situation here with my uh, positioning. <laughs> it's a warm day, so I don't wanna be in the sun. So uh, let's talk about some of these variants of concern now. And, you know, the nomenclature has evolved. There was this older nomenclature, for example, what's known as alpha now was called B.1.1.7, uh, which reflects its lineage from the original strain uh, that from Wuhan, China. Uh, but B.1.1.7, B1, let's say, uh, it was also known as the UK variant, okay, because it was first detected in the United Kingdom. Uh, one notable feature that it has is this mutation, D614G. And there was a time a year ago when this, there was a lot of discussion about D614G and what that mutation might do to the stability of the spike protein and its ability to, you know, uh, be activated when the virus um, um, comes in contact with the cell surface and so on. A great deal of discussion about it, okay? Now that discussion has largely faded and that's because other variants have arisen. So I'm gonna mention some of those. Uh, one is called beta, also known as the South African variant because it was first de detected in South Africa, B1351. Gamma arose in Brazil, it's called the Brazil variant, and actually called P1. It was very prominent in, a, in Manaus, Brazil, which is in Amazonia along the Amazon River. Um, when was that? Um, I guess in maybe December or something like that, where people were actually, who had already been infected with uh, <clears throat> Uh, COVID-19 were getting reinfected with this new variant. So it's causing a lot of alarm there, uh, especially in Brazil. <clears throat> now, one thing I want to say about the nomenclature, the, the, you know, this first one is called UK because it was detected in the UK. It doesn't mean that it originally rose there or that the UK is somehow responsible in any way for this variant. Uh, one thing about the UK is that it has a very robust um, testing effort and sequencing, sequencing effort, so that uh, many, many uh, more viruses are sequenced in the UK than anywhere else, including the United States. And so they they find these variants, they detect them early on. So it, uh, you know, that's why it's called UK, not because it necessarily arose there first. Um, 
Delta. And Delta is the one that's really been in the news lately. And I'm going to talk more about it. B16172, uh, called the India variant because it arose in October of last year in Maharashtra, India. Uh, we'll talk a, more, a lot more about Delta shortly because that's the primary variant of concern now. And then there's Epsilon, uh, which is known as the California variant. We have our own variant, California, B1427 slash B1429. Now, again, each of these variants has a suite of mutations. Uh, and one particular mutation that's important in beta, gamma, and delta, but not alpha, or, or epsilon for that matter, uh, is this e, E484K. It's thought to reduce the effectiveness of natural antibodies against the virus. Although let me quickly add that the vaccines that we have available uh, to us in the United States do work against all of the variants so far. <clears throat> so let's talk about the Delta variant, B1617. It emerged in October, 2020 in Maharashtra, India. And at one point, uh, India was experiencing 4,500 deaths per day at the peak uh, of the worst of the pandemic, which is a tremendous number of deaths. The United States um, reached about 4,000 at one point in that late winter, uh, in that winter time uh, peak that we saw in, in December, January. <clears throat> February. Um, there are three sublineages, B16171, B16172, and B16173. The sublineage B16172 is spreading the fastest globally, and it's spreading rapidly in the US as well. So let's look at that. And we'll see how its, it's uh, numbers have increased and the, the percentage of the virus that is that particular variant has increased uh, to over now 20%. So the Delta variant um, has, has a share of uh, new cases, right? Delta variant cases as a share of new cases has increased now to 20 to 25%. So 20 to 25% now of uh, cases are this Delta variant. And actually, it's spreading, uh, particularly in regions of the country where, where people are not getting vaccinated. So I, I heard something uh, just the other day by a couple of people, uh, both CDC Director Wel Walensky and uh, NIAID Director Tony Fauci, who said that more than 99% of in infections, new infections these days, are of unvaccinated people. So. We're truly vaccination is the key to warding off the virus, including these variants like Delta. <clears throat> but if you look here in some states, this is a cluster of states here shown in dark red, um, close to or even more than now, more than 50% of, of the, the population is not vaccinated. Is, let, me, let me say this is not about directly people who are, who are unvaccinated. But I, there's a strong correlation between the prevalence of the Delta variant and the degree of the percent of people who are not vaccinated. Those correlate very, very closely. Uh, but this is, you see in these states here, in this cluster of states, now even Arkansas, uh, there's a, a high prevalence of Delta, reaching uh, half the number of cases are Delta. <clears throat> so Delta is the uh, dominant strain in Britain as of the end of June, and it's gaining ground in Germany, France, and France. And uh, Delta is reportedly 40 to 60% more transmissible uh, than the Alpha is, but vaccinated people are protected. Vaccinated people in the US in particular are protected. So again, that is the key to avoiding the Delta variant and avoiding 
COVID-19 uh, infection in general, is to get vaccinated. <clears throat> so if you have any holdouts in your family, try to convince them. And many families do uh, have holdouts. And the reason why people, people are hesitant varies. Uh, and it happens on, on both sides of the political spectrum. So anyway. All right. So let's now look at how COVID-19 affects the body. Um, and I've relied on this article by Wadman et al. in Science from April of last year to sort of um, give a summary of what happens. And I made a few grammatical changes on this slides compared to the one you have, but it's very similar. So here's a quote from the paper. Although the lungs are ground zero, COVID-19's reach can extend to many organs, including the heart and blood vessels, kidneys, gut, and brain. So let's talk about these different organs and parts of the body then, and, and what happens there. So in the lungs, so the virus enters through the nose and throat, which are rich, with, who the, whose cells uh, are rich in the receptor for SARS-CoV-2, called the ACE2 receptor, where it multiplies. Then it invades lung cells, and these cells that line the alveoli in lungs are rich in ACE2 receptors as well. So uh, the immune system then attacks the virus, releasing chemokines. And uh, the, re the result of this attack, if you will, is pneumonia. Okay. Many patients recover at this stage, but some develop what's known as acute respiratory dist distress syndrome or ARDS, whereby oxygen levels plummet. These patients require mechanical respiration. And unfortunately, many of them don't make it. For a smaller subset of hospitalized patients, a hyperinflammatory cytokine storm can develop. Here, the body attacks its own tissues. Sometimes there are dramatically low levels of oxygen in the blood. And yet, interestingly, patients are not gasping for breath. Here, alveoli are not blocked. Rather, capillaries are severely constricted. So there's this interesting phenomenon where there's low oxygen in the blood, but the patient, for some reason, are not gasping for breath, which is what you would expect under such hypoxic conditions. Now, let's look at heart and blood vessels. The virus often, in about 20% of hospital cases, attacks the heart and blood vessels, heart and blood vessels. And in one third of ICU cases, and these were studies uh, done uh, in China uh, uh, during the pandemic there, in one third of ICU cases, abnormal and excessive blood clotting is seen. This can cause stroke or pulmonary embolism. Blood vessels are constricted, causing ischemia. Now the risk factors uh, for the disease are mainly actually vascular. Diabetes, obesity, age, hypertension, but interestingly, not asthma, although lung disease is a as a risk factor. Other organs that are affected by the virus include kidneys, and there's renal failure in 20%, 27% of hospitalized patients. The brain is affected, where the patient can suffer seizure-like symptoms, loss of consciousness, stroke, and possibly brain stem infection, which by the way, can cause um, can be the reason why uh, patients uh, don't know that their blood oxygen levels are low. They're not responding appropriately to the low blood oxygen level because there's something going on with their brainstem and the autonomous uh, nervous uh, response. The gut, um, patients sometimes experience diarrhea, vomiting, and, and abdominal pain. Um, and, and, you know, if somebody comes in with, with these symptoms, diarrhea, vomiting, 
normally under normal conditions in a normal time, people would not suspect something like uh, COVID-19. They would think it's just some of the, you know, the stomach flu, you know, or something like that, a norovirus. <clears throat> so this is an uh, somewhat un unusual symptom of, of COVID-19. Um, now, some infected people are asymptomatic. That is, they don't have any symptoms, but they're still infected, or they have mild symptoms, cough, fever, sore throat, loss of taste and smell. Uh, and this is generally true for children. They're often uh, asymptomatic or have very mild symptoms, although exceptions exist. Some children develop Kawasaki disease-like symptoms. And the other thing is that even if a person uh, survives COVID-19, there can be, uh, they can still experience uh, effects months later. And this is called long COVID. And the, the causes for this are not fully known, but they're being investigated. And I wanna emphasize that asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic people can spread the virus by infecting others. This is well known now. All right, so let's now uh, sort of take a look at this uh, virus and where it arose. COVID-19, uh, SARS-CoV-2 was first detected in Wuhan, China, which is in the Hubei province. Um, and uh, not too long after the virus was sequenced, um, the sequence of a bat virus uh, was uh, discovered or rediscovered and published uh, called RATG13. And this is the proposed um, bat viral origin of SARS-CoV-2, although we don't really know that. But the point is that its RNA genome is 96% similar, or identical to the genome of SARS-CoV-2. And so people have sort of fingered it tentatively as the bat virus from which SARS-CoV-2 originated. What's interesting about this particular um, bat virus, bat beta coronavirus, is that it was um, isolated from a mine in Yunnan province, which is about 2000 kilometers away from Wuhan. So then the question becomes, so if SARS-CoV-2 also arose there, how did it get to Wuhan? Um, um, anyway, so that's uh, one of the uh, enigmas, one of the questions that, um, and this was in January the 23rd, 2020. So this was uh, shortly after the whole thing uh, broke wide open and uh, the pandemic, you know, there was an outbreak that then spread through the entire world. Okay. So looking now at the virion, this is an electron microgram of a purified, purified SARS-CoV virion. And the one, the virion of SARS-CoV-2 is similar. So SARS-CoV is the original SARS that uh, came about in um, and caused uh, an outbreak or two in 2002, 2003, it was the original SARS. Uh, and this is the picture an electron microgram the variants of this virus uh, actually taken by and published in this paper by Guy et al. with Zheng, Zheng Li Shi. So Zheng Li Shi is a prominent Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, virologist, scientist, uh, who has collaborated with American uh, researchers. Uh, is very prominent there. She's also known as bat woman in China because of her um, research on bat coronaviruses at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. But this was published in 2013. But the point is that the SARS-CoV-2 by Virion looks very much like this. And, and you can see uh, on the surface, these, these uh, what are knobs projecting off. These are what are called the spike protein, okay, uh, that decorate the surface of, of these, these uh, coronaviruses. So I wanna say a little bit about the lineage of coronaviruses. 
So, so coronaviruses such as cars, SARS-CoV-2 are, quote, enveloped, non-segmented, positive sense RNA viruses belonging to the genus beta coronavirus of the subfamily ortho coronavirinae in the family coronaviridae. So that's what they are. So let's take a look at the uh, take a look at this coronavirus spike like a protein. We're going to call it S. So here's a diagram of a coronavirus virion, sort of a generic picture here, where we have the spike protein uh, projecting from the surface. It's a homo trimer, so it's a trimer of identical subunits. We also have a membrane protein, an envelope protein, uh, the nu nucleocapsid protein, which comprises, along with RNA, the nucleocapsid. So it has an RNA genome, RNA genome. Okay. Uh, and uh, this one, hemagglutin est hemagglutinin esterase, is found in alpha coronaviruses. SARS-CoV-2 is a beta, so it's actually not found in beta, but this is a generic picture of coronaviruses. And actually what's interesting about this paper from which this figure is obtained is that it was published in 2015 by Millet and Whitaker. And this is a very nice overview of, of uh, coronaviruses and how they you know, activated at the cell surface and how they're processed in the cell. Uh, and it's amazing uh, how much people had learned about coronaviruses, even back then before this whole thing blew up. Uh, it's, an, it's a very good informative review article. Um, but in part B here, we see a diagram of the structure of the spike protein. So one thing to notice is that there are two protease cleavage sites, S1, S2 site, and S2 prime site. And so proteases, which are enzymes that cleave proteins, certain ones, Will cleave at these two uh, two sites, and that will serve to activate the, the protein a lot and allow it to fuse with the cell membrane, and then release its contents there. Um, so let's talk a little bit, though, about the structure of this uh, spike protein. It has two subunits, S1 and S2. Okay, S1 is involved in a binding to a receptor at the cell surface. And actually, uh, and so for SARS-CoV-2, it's a C-terminal domain, or the C domain, it's the proboxy domain that's involved there. So this S1 subunit has an N-terminal domain and a C-terminal domain. Okay? So these are sort of subdomains within a larger uh, domain called S1. And um, L is a linker. Uh, between the S1, S2, and S2 prime cleavage sites. H1, I'm sorry, HR1 is a heptad repeat one, HR2, heptad repeat two. Uh, TM stands for transmembrane and E endo domain. This is the domain that projects into and is located inside the virion, right? This is a transmembrane or membrane spanning. And then these others, project out, out of the surface. Now, FP stands for fusion peptide. This is the peptide that interacts with the membrane and allows fusion, fusion between the virion and the membrane, virion membrane and the cell membrane, such that contents of virion can be released. Um, so looking now at the spike protein, this is from Walls et al. 2020, in cell, and we can see here, um, there, this figure has different um, panels, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and um, A through C shows the SARS-CoV-2 S primer in its closed, config, closed conformation. And you can see that it's a homo trimer. Uh, we have a blue, uh, a purple, 
or magenta, and a yellow subunit. This is the electron micrograph, the image from the electron, I'm sorry, cryo EM. This is the image from the cryo EM structure. See how it's a little bit uh, sort of blobby looking? This middle one is a cleaned up version of that same image. And then in part C, we see a top down view. And you can see more clearly, you know, the receptor, a binding uh, domain and motifs are located at the top here. There's one, two, three. And this is again the closed conformation of the trimer. Now, this is the viral membrane here. So it projects out from the membrane. Now, let's take a look at what's called the partially open SARS CoV 2 trimer in which one um, uh, binding, H2 binding domain is open. So you see how this blue one points up now? It's a cleaned up version. This is called the open uh, structure confirmation. And, and it only when this is projects up in the open confirmation can the spike protein bind to the H2 receptor on the host cell surface. Here it is again, it's up. Okay. All right. Now, one thing, one thing that phylogenetic analysis has shown, if you look at different bat, and this, is, this includes one through 30, are different bat beta coronaviruses, of which SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 are members. And this is from a paper by Letko, Marzi, and Munster, in 2020 in Nature Microbiology, you can see, uh, here's the list, all these different bat beta coronaviruses. Um, from somewhere in China, except for this one at the bottom, which is in the out group from Bulgaria. I think I misspelled it. They misspelled it, it should be Bulgaria. Um, so what do you notice? That actually uh, uh, this, SARS-CoV-2 is in a clade by itself. Here it is. So it's phylogenetically distinct then from all the ones in the red clade, which include SARS-CoV and this gray clade, which include other bat beta coronaviruses. And here's the one from Bulgaria. So that's interesting. By the way, up here, SARS-Urbani is that SARS-CoV. Um, it was isolated from Guangdong, China, the origin of that SARS outbreak back in 20, 2002. And here, by the way, as we know, SARS-CoV-2 uh, was isolated in Wuhan, in Hubei province, China. So that's a very interesting thing. It's in a clade by, by itself. Um, now, I mentioned RATG13. There's actually a high similarity, 96% um, identity, uh, ribonucleotide identity between SARS-CoV-2 and bat beta coronavirus RAT13, except in the spike uh, um, receptor binding domain. So I want to show that. This is the you know, paper from uh, Zhao et al. 2020. By the way, I've included at the end of this lecture a bibliography of all the papers that I read and many of which I cite uh, here in this, in, in this lecture. So let's take a look at this. So this traces the nucleotide sequence, the whole of the whole genome, the whole RNA genome of different, uh, different uh, bad beta coronaviruses. We have 2019 NCO, WIVO2, that's SARS-CoV-2, okay. bat SARS-related uh, COV, uh, ZC45, bat COV RATG13, and another uh, bat SARS-related uh, COV virus, ZXC21. But let's look in particular at the red and the green, COV-2 and RATG13. And let's look and see how the lines trace nicely, very nice, trace very nicely here. Uh, but now, uh, so that shows there's a great deal of a uh, nucleotide identity between um, 
RITG and SARS-CoV-2. But now let's look within this gray area. You see the dark gray part and the lighter gray part, and it's expanded out here. Uh, and here we see the dark gray, right? And then we see uh, the rest of that, the lighter gray. And we can see an interesting thing. These, again, RATT, SARS-CoV-2 trace almost perfectly until, look at this, that's interesting. Here's uh, SARS-CoV-2, there's uh, RATG. They're diverging here. Uh, otherwise, they're similar. So they're diverging. Let's look in here now. What is this? Well, um, this is exactly the ribosome binding uh, domain um, for those two, or those two uh, I'm not ribosome, receptor binding domain, the RBD. Um, and let's look in there. Let's look in there. What do we notice? Well, uh, let's look at these different areas. Uh, in this dark gray area over here, well, it looks like, um, uh, you know, um, where are we here? CoV2 is resembling RATG, okay? In this other area over here to the, to the right, okay? Look at these lines going down. Again, uh, CoV2, RATG13, very closely related phylogenetically. But now look here. This is the receptor binding motif within the receptor binding domain where there's di divergence between the red and the green. Look here, now CoV2 is grouping, not with RATG13, with, but with a pangolin Co CoV uh, receptor binding motif. That part that binds receptor it is looking very similar to that of, of a virus isolated from a pangolin, which is also known as a uh, spiny anteater. Now, these pangolins are illegally traded in China. And it turns out that some pangolins got, got sick. We don't know how, how they got sick. Uh, and then people isolated uh, new viruses, including a coronavirus, sequenced it. And lo and behold, in that uh, receptor binding motif, there's great similarity between it and CoV-2. And let's look now more specifically, it's hard to see, but if you expand it and look uh, within the receptor, bu uh, receptor binding motif, up at the top, we have the pangolin, okay? And then next to it, we have uh, the, uh, SARS-2. And if you look at the amino acid sequence now, it's identical, except for at this position, I'm not sure what it is, there's a glutamine instead of a histidine, Q instead of H. That's the only amino acid that's different between the pangolin and SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding motif. So how did that how did that happen? We don't know. Some past combination event, probably. So now, what are some interesting features of the SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein? I just want to mention several, three. It has a receptor binding domain that binds the human angiotensin converting enzyme 2, human ACE2 receptor with higher than normal affinity. Its receptor binding domain, again, resembles the receptor binding domain of a pangolin virus in sequence. This higher than normal affinity binding increases the ability of the virus to infect humans and human cells and humans right because it binds to the human ace2 receptor very well much higher than others in addition and we're going to look at that in detail in addition it has a furin cleavage site that proteates furin this is very unusual and this dramatically expands or increases tissue tropism which is the type of tissue that can be infected virulence how well the virus spreads from one cell to another and transmissibility, how easily the virus spreads from one person to another. Okay, so it's a highly transmissible virulent virus that can infect different types of cells. Okay, and it also has an anomalous pattern of non-synonymous versus synonymous mutations in certain regions of the spike protein gene. 
we're going to take a look at that and and we wonder then though does this indicate a past recombination event in which uh in which the uh viral genome of, of an ancestor recombined with a related virus giving this hybrid or chimeric virus that is cov2 or did it happen in the lab we don't know that all right now the now here this slide uh, presents some experimental results, and I don't expect you to understand all of the experimental procedures, but just to understand certain key features or results. This data presented here, these results show that SARS-CoV-2 uses the ACE2 receptor to enter cells, okay? So, and this is by Letco uh, et al. 2020. Uh, and what they did was, <clears throat> they developed a series of vesicular stomatitis, sorry, vesicular stomatitis virus, VSV, uh, particles uh, called uh, viral pseudotypes, okay, that lack the endogenous surface glycoprotein and instead contain, through genetic uh, manipulation, uh, part of the spike protein of a coronavirus. And this allows these viral pseudotypes or um, um, pseudoviruses to, um, to, to um, attach to cells that have uh, a receptor to which that, that, that spike protein will recognize. Okay. Enter the cells and then these uh, uh, pseudotyped uh, VSV um, particles, viral particles, when they enter the cell, release um, an enzyme called luciferase that will cleave a uh, compound that when cleaved releases light. So when light is, is present, when the cells give off light, that proves that the virus was able to enter the cells, they were, the, that the cells were being infected by that virus that has that particular spike protein segment on its surface. So that's basically how it works. Um, so the, it was baby hamster kidney cells that were actually uh, infected and these cells were transfected with one of three different types of receptors in this luciferase-based cell entry assay. Okay, so and green fluorescent protein was a no spike control. Uh, and here are the different um, kinds of receptors that were tested. Tested, okay. Um, ACE, human ACE2 receptor. So these baby hamster kidney cells were transfected with, in this case, ACE2 receptor gene. So ACE2 was on the surface of these cells, BHK cells. Another one was APN. Uh, stands for amino peptidase N, and another is DPP4, which stands for dipeptidyl peptidase 4. Now I think that I think that um, a DPP4 is the receptor for MERS, receptor for MERS. Okay, um, and so they're testing to see if that receptor is what is what um, SARS-CoV-2 recognizes. Now. Um, these up, the I'm going to mention. So all of these, um, so these SARS-CoV, so the SARS-CoV spike uh, with a, with a receptor domain binding domain from these different uh, viruses were used. Now I'm going to mention WIV1, SHC014, and SARS-CoV, SARS. -CoV, SARS Code. All of these, all these three, were previously known to recognize the human ACE2 receptor. And look and see. In fact, we see, you know, light being emitted from these BHK cells that were transfected with human ACE2, all three of them, confirming what we expect. Now look at SARS CoV 2. It also uses the human ACE2 receptor because we see those uh, spots of light indicating entry 
of of the part of the uh, uh, of the viral contents into the cell, but it doesn't recognize APN2 or DPP4. Interestingly, HCoV 299E was known to recognize this APN receptor, and here we see, you know, green light being produced uh, in that case. I guess they didn't show MERS here, but it would have lit up uh, in this um, case with DPPN DPP4 on the surface. So, bottom line, SARS-CoV-2 uses the human ACE2 receptor to enter cells. Um, and the uh, human ACE2, uh, ACE2 enzyme or protein is a functional receptor for SARS-CoV-2. So here's some experiments that were done by Walls et al. 2020. And again, you don't have to understand all of the uh, nuances of these experiments, just the results. Um, what they did was they looked at the entry of murine leukemia virus pseudotyped with SARS-CoV-2S, SARS-CoV-S, or a SARS-CoV-2S that has been knocked out where the receptor binding domain, I'm sorry, not correct, not correct. A, a mutant form of SARS-CoV-2 where the furin's cleavage site was messed with, was altered and rendered um, uh, rendered uh, inactive. Or in other words, they knocked out the furin cleavage site. And they looked at the entry of these uh, pseudotype viruses or viral pseudotypes uh, into what are called Vero E6 cells. And this is, these are green monkey kidney cells that are known to express an ACE2 receptor on their surface that's very similar to the human ACE2, practically identical. Uh, and here we see, we, look, we can look at pseudovirus, pseudovirus uh, entry into the Vero E6 cell by looking at um, relative luciferase units, or maybe that's light units, I don't know. Um, RLUs, what do we see? When we look at uh, cells, of course, without any being exposed to any uh, pseudoviruses, there's nothing. <clears throat> when we look at uh, SARS-CoV-2, that's been pseudotyped with the uh, spike protein S, you can see that it enters cells. Uh, so does SARS-CoV. And here's something that's interesting. When we knock out the furin cleavage site, we still have entry. Actually, we have more entry. Um, and so what the first two bar, what this first bar graph shows is that uh, not only does the uh, receptor attach to ACE2, but, uh, but the, it's allowing the virus to enter the cells. Um, now, what about BHK uh, cells? These don't have ACE2 on their surface endogenously. But if you transfect these cells with the human ACE2, they do. And we see that the cells alone um, that have ACE2 that are not exposed to pseudoviruses, of course, don't give any, I don't show any entry, of course, it's a negative control. Um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, S, um, being exposed to BHK cells that don't, that haven't been transfected with ACE2, of course, that's don't give any entry. That's a negative result. Well, actually, what it shows is that ACE2 is required for entry, okay, because when the cells don't have it, they don't enter. And then, and then here, when the cells do express ACE2 on the surface, the pseudotype viruses do enter. And even when you knock out the furin cleavage site, they still enter, uh, although not, it's not quite as well. So, so one thing, there's a couple of conclusions from this. One is that uh, human ACE2 is a viable receptor and is used uh, by the virus for entry into cells. And the other is that the furin cleavage site is not required for entry into every cell type because it can enter these cells even when the furin cleavage site is knocked out. Ferro E6 and BHK that express H2. 
Uh, but we'll see a case shortly where absolutely furin cleavage was required. And that's for um, human lung airway cells. It's definitely required there. But here we see um, in part C, um, a multiple sequence alignment of various SARS-CoV S proteins. Here's CoV-2, there's RATG, that's SARS-CoV and other bat beta coronavirus um, 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 like uh, proteins. And this particular region here uh, that corresponds to where the furin cleavage site is, the S1, S2 furin cleavage site is right here between that R and that S. So notice that SARS-CoV has this very interesting insert, PRRA. That insert allows for a very potent furin cleavage site to be present. And actually furin cleavage right there between that R and that S. Okay. None of these other similar beta coronaviruses have that furin cleavage site, including RATG13, from which, uh, with which SARS-CoV-2 is very closely related in terms of its RNA genome. So not only does RATG13 not have the, um, the, the receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2, but it lacks a furin cleavage site. So although it may be uh, you know, uh, an ancestor, clearly something happened along the way between RATG13 and what we have now with uh, CoV-2. And then figure D here is a Western blot analysis of the SARS-CoV S murine um, leukemia virus, the SARS-CoV-2 S MLV, or the SARS-CoV-2 S that has its furin site knocked down. And what do we see here? Uh, we noticed that uh, that for SARS-CoV-2 uh, cleavage does occur. Uh, here's the spike protein, the full spike protein. Uh, from SARS-CoV, and when that furin site is knocked out, so it's not cleaved, you have the full length protein. But when, when the furin site is not knocked out, we do get cleavage to the smaller fragments uh, detected on the Western blot, S2. Um, what was I gonna say? Now, one thing they, the, the authors, the scientists discovered in this paper was that when they were generating the pseudoparticles in human, human embryonic kidney 293 cells, uh, there's obviously a furin there, uh, enzyme, and it cleaves the protein so that the particles themselves have an already cleaved uh, S protein. Um, and they, they, they speculate that there may be a furin in the, the Golgi apparatus there that's uh, cleaving the protein. And when it gets incorporated into the pseudoparticles that butt off, um, they already have the S protein cleaved. That's one more there. All right, so um, now let's look at the binding of the S protein to, to human ACE2 receptor. And, and it binds more tightly than does SARS-CoV. So here we have a table showing different dissociation constants, KD values in nanomolar and units. For the SARS-CoV-2 S protein and the SARS-CoV S protein. So this is um, the novel coronavirus and this is the SARS-2, the SARS, original SARS uh, coronavirus. So what do we notice? Okay, these are three different papers that uh, looked at this. And remember that um, the larger a dissociation constant is, the weaker the binding, because it means that whatever it is tend to, tends to dissociate more. Uh, and the equilibrium position lies more toward dissociation when the KD value is large. So obviously we see that um, CoV2S binds more tightly in every case, uh, 
4.2 fold more tightly, 6.6 and 22.1. Um, so these values are somewhat different, but they all agree that the um, SARS-CoV-2 -CoV uh, S protein binds more tightly to it than human ACE2 receptor. Now, one reason for the, the difference, so these first two are quite similar, the values are not that, not that terribly different, but this one at the bottom here has very different values uh, for these, for these KT values. And the reason people think is because RAP et al. Uh, used an intact S protein trimer for their binding studies. Whereas the other two uh, researchers used only the S protein uh, receptor binding domain, which is called the S super B domain by Waltz. So that could explain the discrepancy or some of it between those values. But again, it binds more tightly. That's the point. It binds more tightly to ACE2. So let's take a look now at the structure of the SARS CoV 2 receptor binding domain bound to uh, human ACE2 receptor. So this has now been determined by X-ray crystallography, the, the complex between the, recep the receptor binding domain and the ACE2 receptor, shown in green here. So um, now the receptor binding motif is a subdomain within the receptor binding domain. And that RBM is shown in red here. This is um, the same thing, just rotated 180 degrees. So here we're looking at the front side and here we're looking at the back side, just to see the different aspects of this interaction. And this important helix here uh, in the H2 receptor interacting with the ribosome binding motif shown here. One thing that's interesting, by the way, is that there are four disulfide bonds that help to uh, keep this um, receptor binding motif in the proper structure. You can see this beta leader sheet here, you can see some helices, some, some strands, beta strands, uh, loops here. Uh, this is the structure. And this is the diagram, show, again, showing the uh, structure in terminal domain, ribosome binding domain with the binding motif in the middle. Um, and so on, fusion peptide, peptide repeat, strand membrane segment, intracellular, it might be a misnomer, it's inside the viral particle, virion. I'm not sure what SD1 and SD2 stand for. Try to figure that out. Um, yeah, try to figure that out later. Okay, but let's take, take a look at the interface between SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding moti motif and the ACE, human ACE2 receptor. Zoom in on that interaction, okay? So we see the green ACE2 receptor, we see the, the purple and blue of the um, re receptor binding motif, for CoV2 and for CoV, the original SARS, okay? Uh, remember, I showed you data showing that CoV2 binds more tight. So what could explain that more tight binding? So structural and biochemical data show that the SARS-CoV2 receptor binding domain recognizes the human ACE2 receptor better than does the SARS-CoV receptor binding domain. That's in part because there are subtle but important changes at two binding hotspots on ACE2. Let's look at those. There's a what's called the lysine 31 hotspot and the lysine 353 hotspot. Let's look at those. So let's look at the original SARS and its interface with uh, ACE2. We notice a couple of salt bridges, one involving this light scene 31, which forms the salt bridge, 
with uh, glutamate 35 here in this hot spot. And then we see over here, see over here, this um, uh, lysine 353 forming this salt bridge with aspartate 38. This also, by the way, a threonine with its OH group forming a hydrogen bond with a main chain group here, amino, I suppose. So that's SARS. Now let's look at SARS-CoV-2. What do we see? Some differences, okay? Leucine-455 has replaced tyrosine-442. And the result of that is that um, well, one thing about, let's say leucine, leucine 455 is smaller uh, and it allows, it, it doesn't push up against these residues and allows them to reach down and form interactions here, okay? These interactions now between um, this, um, see an interaction here between this glutam uh, glutamine 493 and that lysine 31, and between the glutamine 493 and the, uh, the um, glutamate 35. So we have these new interactions here. And over here in the lysine 353 hotspot, what do we see? The salt bridge, which has been disrupted by the replacement of um, what? Threonine 487 with this uh, asparagine 501. That replacement disrupts that salt bridge and a lot, well, partially. And you have new interactions here, including this uh, hydrogen bond between lysine 353 and a main chain group uh, down here on the, um, on the, uh, in the ribosome, right, uh, not ribosome, receptor binding motif, okay? So these new interactions across the interface and CoV2 uh, allow for a tighter, tighter interaction, a tighter bond, uh, which is a hallmark, a hallmark now of CoV2. Also, by the way, if you mutate these particular residues, um, the loose, the um, any of these residues that are involved in these interactions here, you, you mutate them to something else so that they can't form those interactions, that reduces the binding affinity and so all protein pull down assays, which also shows that uh, that, they, that the interactions were strengthened uh, by those those new residues. And the other thing I want to point out about residue 501 here is that um, there's a mutation that exists uh, in the B117 uh, variant, UK variant, uh, in which uh, N501 has been changed to a, a tyrosine, a Y, N501Y. And that actually um, served for some reason to uh, increase um, the receptor binding uh, affinity as well. Uh, and that's a very important mutation that's seen in a lot of these uh, variants now. Now, uh, it was a it arose, it arose in that first alpha variant. Seen in others too. All right, so where are we? Um, uh, hold on folks, I see that I'm um, here on my deck. Looks like um, my dog is making some noise. So I think I need to take care of him and uh, let him go inside. So I'm gonna do that now. Okay, back again. All right, so what I wanna illustrate here is something about the coronavirus life cycle with a focus on host cell proteases that activate uh, the spike protein. So uh, at the top in part A, what we see is a diagram of how these cellular proteases work, okay? So um, P represents residues of the peptide ch chain that's being cleaved. And the cystyl bond, that's the bond that's cleaved, uh, is represented here between P1 and P1 prime. And these different residues uh, interact with and recognize different 
active sites in the um, binding site on the protease, the protease active site. So the peptide or polypeptide binds in there and then a certain bond is cleaved. This is the cystyle bond. Uh, and there's several different proteases that are important for coronaviruses in general. One of them is trypsin. Uh, we'll see trypsin before. It's actually a digestive uh, protease, but it can be involved on the cell surface in processing proteins and activating them for cell entry. Furin, which we've been concerned about. Uh, and then cathepsin L, shown in the pro form here, inactive form. But um, so this part C, we see a, a, a diagram of the life cycle of a coronavirus. So some of these coronaviruses, but not COVID-2, are cleaved by trypsin, okay? Um, um, even before they bind to the receptor shown with a, a little green uh, symbol here. So the coronavirus virion uh, can bind to its receptor. In the case of COVID-2, it's um, ACE2 receptor. Uh, and at that point, the protease TMPRSS um, can um, cleave uh, the S protein uh, and activate it, allow fusion with the cell membrane. Uh, and here we see uh, a, a somewhat different type of entry through endocytosis. Um, I don't know if that occurs for COVID-2 or not, but it does occur for some coronaviruses. A furin can act near the cell surface there. And what we'll see soon in a slide is that both furin and TMPRSS uh, are required for entry of COVID-2 into lung airway cells, okay? Uh, so furin is another protease. And then they are sort of um, endocytotically um, transported into the cell where uh, through the action of cathepsin for some of them, uh, they're allowed to fuse out of that uh, the endocytotic vesicle, vesicle and release their contents, including the, the RNA genome, which is a template for the synthesis of not only messenger RNAs for the synthesis of proteins, but also additional RNA molecules uh, to be packaged into new variants that butt off. So, um, what was I going to say? So some of those messenger RNA uh, molecules then are used as uh, a template for the production of proteins that uh, are, uh, especially the glycoproteins like the spike protein are extruded into the uh, Golgi, so maybe the ER and then the Golgi and they're processed in the Golgi apparatus where a number of different proteases, including TMPRSS and furin are involved. In, in the, the processing and the maturation of the proteins. These are assembled into new particles uh, and they then uh, uh, are transported in vesicles to the cell surface where they butt off and can infect additional cells. And so, so it looks like urine can be involved not only here near the cell surface and be involved in entry but also here in the Golgi complex where they're involved in processing, processing and maturation. All right, so um, I want to emphasize again that SARS-CoV-2 has a furin cleavage site that's absent in related bat coronaviruses. This is another uh, phylogenetic tree. These are beta coronaviruses here. Uh, look at these, there's some, that have furin cleavage sites. MERS does, one called HKU1, this other one, HCOVOC43, uh, but none of the viruses closely related to COVID-2 has, has a furin cleavage site, which is enigmatic. What does that mean, right? So here is that PRRA insert that forms a cleavage, cleavage site, furin cleavage site. It's totally missing in this very related very related, of course, related virus that, that, that um, groups with um, SARS-CoV-2. 
in this phylogenetic analysis. So that's an interesting fact. Closely related viruses don't have it. Uh, here's another depiction of that. Closely related viruses don't have the purine cleavage site, although other di more distantly related ones do, right? Ones with which uh, the, 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 the ancestor of CoV-2 would be less likely to engage in recombination with these others. Uh, but, but, but the S prime cleavage site is very uh, much conserved uh, among uh, related, related beta coronaviruses. There it is, it's intact. So um, I mentioned this a bit earlier in passing that both furin and TMPRSS uh, are essential for SARS-CoV-2 activation and spread. What does TMPRSS2 stand for? Transmembrane serine protease type 2. It's part of a whole class of proteases that act at the cell surface. So what this shows, this, this theory, this, these results from this paper by Bessel et al. Um, is that S, S protein must be cleaved at both S1, S2 and S2 prime to trigger fusion of viral and cellular membranes during viral entry into airway cells. Okay, you need to have both of these, both of these sites, okay? If you knock out one, okay, or knock out the other, okay, you don't. This doesn't happen. See, that doesn't happen. You don't get entry. Right? So, but if you have both, you do get entry into airway epithelial cells, right? So, and it occurs sequentially with furin acting first, then TMPRSS2. So at S1, S2, then S2 prime. Inhibition of either furin or TMPRSS or both, both prevent entry. Preventing cleavage at S1, S2 may either block a conformational change, shown in the upper bar here, or block TMPRSS2 action. So it, they're not sure about not sure how it happens, right? But when you block urine, you also prevent, uh, you prevent TMPRSS2 from occurring. So this is, and the important result is that both of these uh, proteases are required for entry into airway cells. Now we saw that Vero E6, that green monkey kidney and baby hamster kidney cells don't require furin. So, so experimentally, there may be some uh, uh, divergence from this result. Um, and then here, what I wanna show is that there's a, an unusual synonymous to non-synonymous mutation ratio in the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein sequence. Now this is a somewhat busy slide and, and figure here, uh, but I just wanna walk through some of it, okay? Um, here we have um, coronaviruses uh, grouped according to their um, molecular phylogenetics. Uh, and we see in this group A, we have a, a one, two, three, four, um, four SARS-CoV-2 isolates from patients. Um, and then in the fifth one is, what is that? RATG13. Then we have some uh, pangolin in dark green here. And then we have some other, other pangolin uh, sequences. This first one, is first two, the first pair is from Guangdong province. And the next, next set is from, I think it's Guangzhou province. And these pangolins are different. Uh, and their ribosome binding domains are different and somewhat less similar to that of SARS-CoV-2. But these are all in what are called, what's called group A. And then we have another set of bat coronaviruses which are present in group B. Um, and we see the results to the right that reflect uh, the analysis of non-synonymous 
the, re the, the whether non-synonymous or synonymous um, differences are present when compared to SARS-CoV-2 S protein. So th this is the S protein and we're looking at synonymous over non-synonymous mutations. Uh, synonymous are shown in blue, non-synonymous in red. And I think I need to tell you right now what, what those terms mean. So when you have a mutation uh, in, in a codon, right, for an amino acid, uh, that mutation can occur in such a way that it changes the amino acid that's coded for, that's called non-synonymous, or in, in such a way that it does not change the amino acid that's coded for, that's called synonymous, okay? So um, obviously a non-synonymous mutation is gonna have a more dramatic effect because you're changing the amino acid that's present. Uh, and, and in the presence of a lot of non-synonymous changes relative to the sequence you're comparing it to, which in this case is CoV-2, S protein nucleotide sequence, um, if, if a particular region of a gene is important evolutionarily and functionally, then it will tend to develop uh, synonymous mutations rather than non-synonymous, right? Because you're not, when you change an amino acid, you might change function. But see, you notice what we see here, a lot more red down here, okay? And then a lot less red, especially after this urine cleavage site for these group A. Uh, group A uh, as protein as protein nucleotide sequences. Although you see a lot here within the free and cleavage site itself, and right a bit here, quite a bit here in this ribosome binding motif. But this this block over here to the right, past the free and cleavage site, where you have all of this blue, is kind of striking. Uh, and what it means is that somehow, for some reason. In these other uh, viruses here, including RATG13, right? Um, these re these these sequences, this sequence has been conserved, and so why is that? And it's kind of like a break. It's kind of like a break point here, after the furin cleavage site, where you have quite a few non-synonymous uh, substitutions, but then after that, mostly synonymous. And then down here, that analyzes that where you look at the group A versus the group B uh, sequences compared to SARS-CoV-2. And, and you see that breakpoint there. So after nucleotide 11104, okay, which corresponds to the furin cleavage site, after that, you have a clear difference there between the number of synonymous to non-synonymous. So let's look at that. Okay, so um, so look at this. Look at the group A, group A sequences. Notice the green. They're all quite low, right? Quite low. But then after that, you get a jump uh, after uh, nucleotide one one zero four, right? So that means that you have a lot more uh, synonymous relative to non-synonymous after that breakpoint for group A. That's reflecting this chunk of light blue. Same thing, just expressing it differently. Whereas look here, you're not seeing much of a difference, reflecting the fact that there's uh, equally as much red here in the group B sequences uh, after as before that break point. So that's, uh, I don't, we're, we don't know what that means, but it's an interesting feature. It's nonetheless an interesting feature that we can begin to think about does it indicate some past uh, recombination event involving a pangolin or a bat and a bat? Uh, one other oddity is the skewed distribution of nucleotide frequencies at synonymous sites. So, um, um, in, in, in especially at the third position of codons, which results in what's called homoplasy. So it turns out that that third position, it, um, there's a skewed distribution of nucleotide frequencies uh, at the third position in the song of sites. All right, um, we're getting close to the end folks here. 
What I want to talk now is about spike protein as a glycoprotein, glycoprotein. It's, it's on the outside surface of the virion and it's heavily decorated with carbohydrate groups. Okay? And this is an, a sort of a background slide. This is taken from Cummings and Esco, editors of this book, Essentials of Glycobiology, published in 2009, which talks about different types of complex carbohydrates. So uh, we can have what are called O-glycans and N-glycans. Um, but I haven't talked about this already in, in, on the topic of proteins. I will soon when I talk about glycoproteins. But N-glycans are carbohydrate groups attached to asparagine residues within a certain structural context of proteins. And O-glycans are uh, carbohydrate groups attached to um, serine or threonine residues uh, within a certain structural context of proteins. But uh, it turns out that in, uh, on SARS-CoV-2 glycoprotein, spike glycoprotein, it's the N-glycans that are present, right? And all N-glycans have a common core sequence shown in the red box here. Mannose 1,6, mannose 1,3, mannose beta, I'm sorry, those were mannose alpha 1,6 and alpha 1,3. Mannose beta 1, 4 uh, to a glicnac, which is attached by a beta 1, 4 to another glicnac, which is attached to the asparagine residue through a beta 1 linkage. So this is the base structure that's seen in all of these, right? Now, this one is decorated with a few codes present, but that same base structure is seen. Uh, in, in, in a structure called oligomannose, you have only mannose residues attached in a branch, branched arrangement to that base. But in something called complex, a complex structure, you have uh, two what are called antennae, okay, uh, that are initiated by um, glicnac transferases in which the glicnacs are attached right, to the mannose residues. And then after that, we see um, other residues such as uh, galactose and n acetyl muramic acid also attached. This is one example of a co what's called a complex, complex uh, N glycan. And then we have a hybrid N glycan. And what you see is <clears throat> that this has so like a, a, a hybrid between the two first two types, where on the right hand side we see only mannose, right, branching. Um, and then on the left-hand side, one of those antennae that's, that's found in the complex. This is called hybrid, right? So these are basically three types of N-glycans you can see on glycoproteins. Now, let me walk you through this. This is a figure from a paper by, hmm, it's listed in the, in the article, about the glycans uh, structure of SARS-CoV-2 spike like protein. In part A, we see a diagram, a diagram of the spike protein sequence um, with the locations, the locations of the different uh, and glycans indicated here, the positions along this, this uh, amino acid uh, sequence here. Okay, and then on the right, we see a, a depiction of the different, of the compositions of those carbohydrate groups attached to each one of those asparagine residues. All asparagines, right? So there's asparagine in position 17, okay? So in this figure, the bar graphs show quantities of each glycan group, okay? Oligomannose type is glycans are shown in green. There's a green bar graph there. Uh, Non-fucosylated and fucosylated hybrid glycans are shown in dashed pink. So we see there, where, here, right there, right? Um, and then um, complex uh, glycans that are grouped according to the number of antennae and the presence of core fucosylation or not, shown in pink. So these are all examples of uh, complex 
complex like hands of different types. Um, uh, and you can see down here what the different types are. So now uh, the pie charts show the quantification of these glycans. So let's take a quick look real quick. Look at this N234. See how it's mostly green um, oligomanos? Okay. So the pie chart shows that in fact it's mostly oligomanos with a little bit of this um, uh, comp with a little bit of complex uh, glycan. And you know the distribution is shown, and the heights of the bars show the amount and distribution of these different types of glycans here. Different monosylated ones. We have hybrids, right? Hybrids, and we shown in. Um, the dashed pink, and then we have these complex ones uh, shown uh, in with the solid pink of different types, of different types. Okay. And don't worry about what those different types mean. Just realize they are different types of complex lactans. But anyway, what we see is the variety of different uh, glycosylated uh, glycans present on the spike protein. Um, and finally, finally, um, the um, the, 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 the designation it's like N17, N61, N234 are color coded according to the extent of oligomanose type glycan content, where green means a high content or high extent of, of uh, oligomanose. Uh, yellow, orange means an intermediate, and, and pink means a low content of oligomanose, which is represented by green. So let's, from this same paper now, let's look at the structures. So they, these authors determine the structures of the spike glycoprotein and the, uh, including the glycans and where they are uh, on the structures. It's highly decorated with these different glycans, right? Of different um, analytical manners content, whether it's high or low, you know, green, orange, pink. Blue shows the ACE2 binding site, so the, the side view, right, of the ACE2 binding site shown in blue. And here we have a top-down view of the ACE2 binding site. And I want you to notice that these three glycans, N165, N234, and N343, are involved in shielding the S protein from receptor binding. Okay, and shielding, shielding. Uh, and then we also see uh, these other two glycans which are present on this flexible extended loop. But these three here that shield, right? Uh, they work as long as the spike glycoprotein is in the closed conformation. But when it's activated and goes into the open conformation, one of these, one of these uh, subunits of the homotrimer, uh, one of these subunits flips up the receptor binding domain and that which can interact and it sort of escapes, if you will, it escapes the glycan shielding. So uh, basically this, this, this protein is protected from antibodies uh, in the body until it's activated, and then it's vulnerable. So, and that's one reason why the spike protein, particularly receptor binding domain has been used to develop antibodies. So that, that's a susceptible uh, sort of region of the protein. That's it, folks. I didn't realize that things would be over quite that soon, but it's, it's been a while. Um, that's the end of the lecture. Um, again, these are the objectives. Uh, you will be tested on uh, this material, both in the quiz during the um, uh, flip class and also on exams. So this is material that uh, you'll need to know. These are some extra slides, which are optional in the structure of the virion. This is uh, interesting fact that um, the proteolytic activation of SARS-CoV-2 mimics the activation of another protein, uh, endothelial sodium channel alpha subunit, which may contribute to the pathology of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, some background on vaccines and different types and how vaccines work. Uh, and then this interesting uh, D6, D614G mutation and what it might do that was discovered about a year ago and 
more than a year ago. And now people have an idea of, of what that mutation, which is found in variants, might do. And then uh, sort of a more recent uh, picture of uh, in the U.S. showing cases, new reported cases, um, hospitalization, deaths recently from the New York Times. And here's the bibliography showing different uh, papers that I, I've read. So that's it, folks. I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. And uh, I want to tell you that I um, uh, look forward to seeing you. I'm recording this uh, in early July. Look forward to seeing you in class for the first day of class. By this time, you would have seen me already. Okay. Uh, it's great. I'm going to stop recording now.